As usual, uh, at least for me um, with these things, I'm going to go over stuff really quickly. There's no guarantee that any of this stuff will be on the exam, um, but it's stuff that I think is important, and the stuff that I think is important often ends up on exam. So again, no guarantee whatsoever here um, what's actually going on. And please, as usual, even if your name isn't Ian, stop me and ask questions as we're moving along here. So yeah, we did talk a little bit about bacteriophage right at the beginning. And I basically just wanted to bring up the poto-like viruses, um, A, because they just have these totally amazing structures, uh, but B, because of the conformational changes that have to happen when you have a virus infection process. So again, this theme of conformational changes, you have this structure, which changes into this structure. You lose this, lose all the DNA on the inside when it goes inside the cell. We also talked about lambda, and that reminds me, I thought, oh, I've got all this stuff you know, deposited appropriately in the library. And then I looked at the bottom shelf of my bookshelf and noticed that this was still there. So I will go over there after class today and make sure that these are over there on reserve. They probably won't be available by Wednesday. I'm sorry about that. But for the final, they should be there. Uh, but there's also not that much on lambda in there. That's mostly the stuff which is in our textbook. So the important aspects about lambda here really have to do with the two different possible replication processes, either going through the lytic cycle or going through the lysogenic cycle, and then the decision-making process on how that happens. And the main thing here, again, really has to do with it's the genome, and it's about transcription. Everything about lambda really has to do about transcriptional regulation. There are little exceptions to that, but we haven't talked about them here. Uh, and most of that has to do with all the regulatory things which are going on right here near the C1, CRO, C2, and C3 genes, as well as the N protein. And that N protein is really one of the critical things that gets transcribed on any kind of infection as soon as things come inside the cell. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So as soon as you have infection that takes place, you will have transcription that takes place from PL and from PR. Once that happens, you'll make here the N protein and you'll make the CRO protein. You're not actually making the C1 protein at this point. So with this N protein, now you've made the N protein, it will allow read through through this terminator and this terminator. And again, these are transcriptional terminators. So in the absence of N, the RNA polymerase stops there, and then nothing else happens. But you're making the N protein again, as soon as you have infection. So that N protein is now going to allow you to make C3, C2, and OP and Q. But the important things here are really C2 and C3, because it's the concentration of C2 which is going to determine whether you make C1. And if you make C1, then you're going to have lysogeny. If you don't make C1, then you're going to have lysis. Yes, no, huh? Um, haven't gotten to this point in studying about it yet. Um, so if you don't have C1 around, then you'll end up making Q. And with Q, that will allow the transcription and then translation of all of these late genes and late genes lead to lysis. In the presence of C1, you'll shut down the expression of Q, and that will then lead to lysogeny and the maintenance of lysogeny, just a second, Ian, um, with the presence of C1 leading to more production of C1. Yeah? Um, and 
that that decision initially, or that the result of uh, making enter the queue, the decision to make more enter queue, is controlled by mainly by the proteases of the host cell deciding whether or not you're going to have enough deciding whether or not you're going to have enough C2. Yeah, well, yeah, well it's, it's all through C3, really, that leads to C2. So C2 is the transcriptional activator that will give you C1. That's the promoter for repressor establishment, which is you know, not on this slide, not on any of the ones that I'm using. Uh, so it's that C2, and then the stability of C2 is determined by C3. And C3 is what's being regulated by the cellular proteases and the growth state of the cell. So will C C2 essentially not be present even if it gets um, even if it gets translated it won't be effectively present unless you have C3 there. That is correct. So C2 will not be effectively present unless you have the presence of C3. And the way that I like to think about this is going way back to the genetics, why are they called C1, C2 and C3? Because if you have mutations in any of them you end up with clear plaques, which means you do lysis. So absence of C3, lysis. Absence of C2, lysis. Absence of C1, lysis. So that's, that's the way that I, again, I like, to, like to think about it. OK. So um, how does that work? It works based on, surprise, surprise, it's lambda, transcriptional control. And that transcriptional control is regulated through the binding of DNA binding proteins. And it's really here the competition between the DNA binding by Crow and DNA binding by C1. And the main thing here is that these are opposite affinities. So if you have Crow, you bind at OR3. If you have C1, you bind at OR1. Same thing is true of L, so OL1 and OL3. And what that means is if you have C1, that will block Crow messenger RNA and also PR and stimulate its own transcription. Crow is exactly the opposite way around. In the presence of Crow, you block the production of C1 and you allow the production of Crow and the rest of PR. So any more questions, Ian? Yeah. Um, when they're binding to the repressive opening mm -hmm. in there, uh, it is so the it doesn't bind cooperative, correct? But for the CI, it has to bind. So it's there's something about cooperative binding to keep all of it back. Oh, the idea of cooperative binding. So the idea of cooperative binding is once you have binding of one of those proteins, it will stimulate the binding of more of the, that particular protein. Is and one cooperative and one not, though? So uh, C, uh, for C1, it's known to be highly cooperative. I think for Crow, it's less obvious. That's why this one's not obvious. Yeah. Okay, so basically, once you have binding at um, OR1, again, let's just think about C1 and the cooperativity of C1. If you have binding at OR1, that you have starts out binding here. This will block you know, Crow messenger RNA and starts to stimulate the production of more C1 messenger RNA. But after you get enough of this, then it will bind to here and bind to here. And so basically, it's, it's a regulatory mechanism that shuts it off after you have a certain amount. And so otherwise, if it's just producing more and more of the lambda C1 protein, it's a you know, positive feedback loop. So you end up just with ridiculous amounts. You have to have some way of regulating that. And so that's what the idea of the cooperative binding is. Now, in terms of, of Crow, who cares if you've got too much Crow? Because you're lysing the cell anyway. OK, so the other part about Lambda is lambda integration that I think it did a really horrible job of explaining the first time through. There are identical sequences in the lambda genome and in the bacterial genome. It's infecting E. coli, so this is the E. coli genome. 
And here you have this, what's called the operator site. This operator site, look, it's got the same letter. It means it's the same sequence. But this is an identical sequence, which is present in both of these. There's the, an, what's called an attachment site in the phage genome. That's why it's at P, attachment site in the bacterial genome at B. Again, this central site, the O site, which is exactly the same in both of these. And then these sites on the outside, which are slightly different. So this is a, what they call a flanking region in the phage. This is the other side of the flanking region in the phage. Same thing for the bacteria. And when you have recombination that takes place here, you're going to have flanking region in the bacteria, operator, which is the same, phage sequence, so B crossing over to P, going all the way around and coming back, copy of the operator, P, O, B prime. And so that's what you have in the genome. That's your provirus. To get this, all you need is the integrase gene. In order to get this reverse reaction to take place, you have to also have the excisionase gene, which is made when you have virus induction. OK, so I wanted to, again, talk through that a little bit more in detail. Yeah? And those genes transcribed uh, by, or those genes are um, allowed to be transcribed by the presence of Q, prolonged presence of Q? So Q is going to be leading to lysis. This is lysogeny. So it's actually C2, which leads to the expression of int. Um, and then when you have induction, you've gotten rid of C1. And then you're going to start making excise, which will then lead to everything else. OK, and then we talked briefly about assembly. That reminds me about the DVD, which I also haven't put on reserve, mea culpa. Uh, but here, the idea is what you've got a <clears throat> Excuse me, a concatamer of the genome. And I mentioned this. How many of you are in micro? A couple of you heard my toilet paper analogy um, for thinking about concatamers, which I think is a really good one. <laughs> um, and you've got each of the sheets of paper is basically one genome, but you've got a whole roll of them. And that's exactly what's happening here. You can either do head full packaging, which I talked about for T4, it's important for micro, not for here, uh, but at least for lambda you tear at every single one of those sheets. And that tearing process is the terminase protein. And then you take that sheet and stuff it into the head. So um, that's, I thought, was a useful thing to talk about there. So switch gears, talk about plant viruses. Again, this is a ridiculous oversimplification of the plant viruses. Uh, just talking basically about the bro mosaic viruses, a little bit about TMV, and then the thermal tolerance virus, which actually isn't really a plant virus at all. So <clears throat> message here, of course, is these are RNA viruses. They also have these really amazing conformational changes that happen in the virion. In this case, instead of a single tail-like protein or core protein that undergoes a conformational change, it's the whole virion that undergoes a really big conformational change. And then, of course, these have segmented genomes, segmented genomes in such a way that actually each of the individual virions actually only has one, or in some cases, two segments of these genomes, which is really crazy from an evolutionary point of view, except when you think about the vector, which is moving these viruses around, which carries very large numbers of virions with it. So any kind of inoculation has very large numbers of virions. And so statistically, you will have enough of the individual capsids, each carrying different genome types, in order to get a productive infection. Um, what's interesting is why doesn't this happen with some of the human vector diseases? You would think it's a kind of a similar thing, because mosquitoes also carrying multiple virions. Why do we not see this in? humans or animals? Who knows? Um, interesting question. Um, those genomes themselves are reasonably normal. 
Um, mostly difference here has to do with the three prime end of the genomes. Five prime end, capped, completely normal messenger RNA. The three prime end has this really fascinating structure to it. And that structure serves as a substrate for the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. They can bind to this tRNA-like structure and put an amino acid on to that, which really protects the end of the genome, which is mostly what poly A tails are important for, is protecting that end of the genome. So here, it's that tRNA structure. One of the big advantages of having a tRNA structure like that from an evolutionary point of view is you don't have to code a whole bunch of A's in your genome. You don't have to have some kind of stuttering mechanism, as we've talked about for a lot of these negative strand RNA viruses, in order to add a bunch of A's. Here, you can have a relatively compact genome to be able to have all of these. And this, you got a question? Sorry. Um, it was about the, the segmented genomes. And is it, is there a, do we find a greater size limitation? in terms of captive size for plants than we do for um, other eukaryotic or um, animal viruses? So, because a lot of them need to move through the plasma desmata. So the, the, the question here, and sorry to paraphrase, is do or is there some kind of size limitation on the plant viruses, maybe because how they're moving around inside the actual plant? And the answer is there's no way to generalize for all plant viruses. TMV is humongous, but still it manages to spread through the plant. But certainly in terms of packaging, in the case for the brome mosaic viruses or the cucumber mosaic viruses, those definitely have a very defined capsid size. And then there's a particular length of nucleic acid that can fit inside it. Now, whether that's important also for moving around inside the cell I don't know. I don't think it's one of the major issues. I don't think it's actually the capsids that move. I think it's the nucleic acids that are moving around. But I'm not completely certain on that point. I did actually, somebody asked, I forget, uh, when we were talking about this in the first lecture, um, these replicate in these micro compartments inside the cell. Are there multiple genomes that are replicating there? So I reached out to some of my colleagues at OSU, and they said, oh, we don't know either. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, do you have a question? So yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I completely follow. So CCA is actually the part of the tRNA. Okay. So it's just you know, cytosine, cytosine, adenine. And then that has an amino acid that gets added to it. That's yeah, true for that's all of the tRNA. So all tRNAs, um, whether it's a fake tRNA like this one or a cellular tRNA, they always have CCA. And often that it gets added through a totally different process that I didn't even talk about in molecular last term. <laughs> So, but yeah, those CCA residues are, that's one of the things that gets recognized by the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So the enzyme that will put on that amino acid. Okay, and then wanted to just mention these mostly because these are very general kinds of proteins that you find in RNA viruses. RNA1 encodes your methyltransferase, which is important for doing what? Methylase is a cap. It's all about the cap and the capping process. Um, RNA2 has, surprise, surprise, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So if you, have, if you have, again, if you have an RNA genome and you need to make both your RNA and to make messenger RNAs, we're all dependent on the, we being all the viruses, or after all, mostly virus, um, are all dependent on cellular translation machinery. So we have to have some way of getting the ribosome to the start codon. In many cases, it's a cap. If you're not replicating the nucleus, not like influenza, going to the nucleus and stealing caps, you have to have some way of making a cap. Or, and getting a little ahead of ourselves here, for the picoRNA viruses, you have irises, which bring the translation machinery to the start codon. So some way of making caps. Any RNA virus is a way of making caps or at least getting the translation machinery to the beginning of your message, which is going to get translated. Um, we <clears throat> talked briefly about these movement proteins. These are the ones which are really specific to plants because 
you get into one cell, then you've got to move to all of the other cells that are present in the genome. But the main sort of reason that I wanted to emphasize these is not so much those individual proteins, but you have to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So you have to have a way of making caps or at least some way of getting the translation machinery to the right place on your RNA. Yeah? And that typically happens in movement after encoding? The movement, as far as I know, almost always happens after you have the encoding process. It's the genome which is being moved. I'm not 100% certain on that. In fact, I should write another email to my friend Valerian down at OSU and ask him about it. That's what he does, is, is movement proteins. <laughs> so I can't not talk about this because I think it's one of the coolest stories around, actually the hottest story around, um, as far as viruses are concerned. Uh, it has to do with these thermal tolerant plants that are only thermal tolerant when they're infected with an endophytic fungus and that fungus infected with a virus. In the absence of either of those, endophytic fungus or virus, um, these guys do not do well at all. Otherwise, they're great, and we literally see these when we go out into the field. You can see the dicanthelium growing right next to the hot spring. And you can put a thermometer in there, and it will give you 50 plus degrees C. It's, it's really pretty amazing. Shifting gears completely. Um, now, diseases. Some people care about diseases, some more than others. Uh, <clears throat> Poliomyelitis used to be a really major problem. Now we have vaccines. It's almost completely gone. Uh, there was some issues, I think, that people had with some of the terminology. The inactivated polio vaccine, that's the one that was developed by Salk. And so it's a lot of normal polio, which then gets inactivated. And that inactivated virus is used in the flu, uh, sorry, flu polio shot. Um, which then got rid of most of polio in the U.S. and most of the developed world. The oral polio vaccine is one of these attenuated vaccines. And so attenuation is just taking a virus, growing it, usually in cell culture, for multiple what we call passages. So you grow the virus, you infect the cells, you grow the virus, you infect the cells. You do this literally hundreds of times. And then you end up with a virus which still gives a good immune response but no longer causes disease. In the case of poliomyelitis, it's a neural disease which happens even though polio is an enterovirus and is normally replicating in the gut. Um, OPV is great on one hand because it replicates again in the gut, gives you a nice immune response, and then can infect other people because what happens for the gut, the gut contents get <coughs> left other places and then are used as uh, <clears throat> part of an inoculum. That's the great part about OPV. The bad part about OPV is you have reversion in relatively rare cases. And so it goes from being non-pathogenic to pathogenic. And that's why in order to really truly get rid of poliovirus, we are going to have to go back to doing injections, which is a lot harder to do, you need to make a lot more virus, and particularly in the developing world, which is where most of these cases are, it's a lot harder to do needle injections than it is to do an oral polio vaccine. Yeah, in the back. How do you grow inactivated? How do you grow inactivated? Um, you actually grow active, and very large amounts of it, and then inactivate it, usually with formalin, formaldehyde, something like that. So it's a chemical inactivation step. So you're growing it in cell culture. So um, what it means is actually you have large amounts of infectious polio virus that you do have to be pretty careful with, <laughs> not surprisingly. So I think originally, and okay, I'm getting well away from my expertise here, but I think the original polio vaccine was made in HeLa cells. But they've switched over to using monkey cells for, I think, the vast majority of the production of the inactivated polio virus now. Um, there's some issues about that that we'll talk about after the midterm. But <laughs> um, that's for the most part, it's using monkey cells. So it's not using HeLa cells anymore. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I have to remember my question. Oh, it was uh, IPV. So yeah. we have OPV replicating in the gut. Mm -hmm. Would IPV, since it's inactivated, are we? going to be placed somewhere else in the system? 
<laughs> yeah, no, so it's, it, uh, the IPV is in, it's not replicating. So it's right. just antigens at that point. And so there's the, the best you can get it to your immune system, which seems to be, you know, injection. Okay, so where is polio circulating, um, at least the wild polio, all in places that it's really hard to get to and do vaccinations. Uh, but we're getting closer, but you know, things, things come and go. I actually heard some reports of new polio cases in Nigeria um, just in the last year. So it's going to be kind of a little bit of a whack-a-mole um, issue as far as that's concerned. How does polio get inside the cell? This is very analogous to what happens with the potoviruses that I showed on the very first slide here is we have a conformational change in a virus protein. Here it's the <clears throat> VP4 protein and VP1 proteins that undergo a major conformational change when you have interactions with the poliovirus receptor. Once you have this conformational change, the genome is released and comes into the cytoplasm together with the VPG protein, which is covalently bound to the three prime end of the genome. So all picoRNA viruses have these proteins covalently bound to the three prime end of the genome, which clearly leads to a problem as far as what we were just talking about, as far as RNA viruses are concerned. If it's gonna be translated, you can't use caps because it's got this protein that's associated with the three prime end. So we already talked about irises, we'll talk about them again in just a second here. But the poliovirus genome is one big polyprotein, same thing is true of the flavivirus <laughs> genome, and many of these single-stranded, positive strand RNA viruses that are infecting animals, made as one very large protein, and then gets chopped into smaller pieces by, in the case of all the picoRNA viruses, it's all viral encoded proteases. So it's viral encoded proteases, which are active as part of this polyprotein that will chop both themselves out and the other pieces out. Yeah, Patty. I'm sorry if I missed something. You said the VPG was covalently bound to the three prime end, but on here. Oh, it's the five prime end. So, sorry. That would, be, that would be my mea culpa here. So it's bound to the five prime. It's a three prime OH on the, you know, OH as it were on the VPG, which serves as the <clears throat> primer for genome replication. But yes, thank you. So five prime, 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 five prime. Good, that's why you're here. You have to keep me honest. <laughs> so, um, VPG um, bound at the five prime end of the genome. Uh, you have a five prime non-coding region that we'll get back to in just a second here. The three prime end, there's a poly A tail. <coughs> Where does that poly A tail come from? It's in the genome. So that's actually coded for in the virus genome. So this is an alternative strategy, again, for these RNA viruses is you can encode that whole sequence as long as you're okay packaging it and maintaining it for all the rest of your <clears throat> um, progeny as you're moving through this whole process. So again, viral proteases that chop this into smaller pieces and non-coding regions at both ends, but the most important one here is really this five prime non-coding region. Because of the fact that you have VPG, you can't have normal cellular translational initiation. So we have these internal ribosome entry sites, the irises, which are structures. And no, I'm not going to get you to draw the structure of an iris on an exam. I couldn't do it, so I can't expect you guys to. Uh, but important there is that you have some, but not all, of the translational initiation machinery that will associate with the iris and then allow translational initiation to take place. And remember, this translational initiation is for the whole darn thing. It's the whole polyprotein that gets made at this point. Um, and that's, again, making all the proteins. Those then make proteases. Some of those proteases 
will cleave some of the cellular initiation factors which then will block cellular translation so you end up having almost completely translation of your viral messenger RNA. So if you look at cells, and I think we did, um, I think we looked at that gel, um, look at the protein production of a virus infected cell, almost all of the proteins after virus infection turn out to be just viral proteins, and that's because of this iris dependent. There are some cellular genes that are actually translated from irises as well, so it's not a completely <coughs> viral system. But here, as far as we're concerned, the most part is doing the, the virus and the virus irises here. So that's how you make the proteins. How do you make more genome? Again, I think this is a case where I didn't do a terribly good job. Maybe I was rushing at the end of the lecture in terms of talking about this. So you remember that untranslated region at the five prime end <laughs> um, makes a secondary structure, as we talked about way back when we talked about MS2, the bacteriophage RNA genomes, uh, makes a secondary structure this secondary structure then interacts with various proteins. And the <clears throat> proteins here are both cellular proteins, this is the poly C binding protein, and viral proteins, 3C, and most importantly, the 3D protein. 3D is the viral polymerase, so the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Binds here at the 5' end of the genome, and what it does is it takes this VPG protein and adds a couple of U residues to it. And so here there's a tyrosine which is present in the VPG protein. Tyrosines are wonderful amino acids because they have what? An OH on them. And so that OH can be used by the 3D protein to add a couple of U residues. And this happens here in the context of this structure here at the five prime end and this funky little thing in the middle here. This is a secondary structure which forms in the middle of the picoRNA virus genome and has two A's on it, which is what's used then as a template for these two U's. Um, and again, it's all secondary structures of your RNA here that allows this to take place. Once you have two U's, those two U's can base pair with the poly A tail, which is present in the genome, and then the 3D protein can replicate its way all the way down the genome. This is now a negative strand. It's your antigenome because these are positive strand RNA viruses. Once it gets to the opposite end, it will copy these U's that were attached to VPG back there in the beginning. These now will give you two A's as the end of your antigenome, which of course can base pair with the two U's that have been made on your VPG, so you can make positive strands. Yes, molecular gymnastics, five and three is important. Yeah, Alice. The number of antigenomes that are made relative to the number of, of genomes? Right. It seems to be, and this is you know, kind of more hand wavy, that the initiation that takes place at the poly A tail is not as efficient as the initiation which happens here on this end of the genome. So, it's a chance thing again. so yeah, it just seems to be a chance thing, and the efficiency just seems to be better um, in that case. All of this replication takes place on the surface of membrane vesicles that are inside the cell. Um, and for many of the RNA viruses, that seems to be the case. Is, um, interaction with membranes is really important for getting your replication to take place. And that's probably because that allows you to concentrate the proteins that you need to make all of those extra genomes. And as we'll see for the flaviviruses in just a second, that's important for the production of all of the polyprotein, which is sticking in and out of the membrane. Okay, really briefly, um, talked about this again multiple times. Obviously, the 
RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of the picoRNA viruses looks like a DNA polymerase. Again, that's not terribly surprising when we talk about the fact that it needs an OH and has to have a template in order to replicate. So it's a DNA-like polymerase. It's not like RNA polymerases that are DNA-dependent. It's much more like a DNA polymerase. So some people have asked, is Dr. Hirsch's stuff going to be on the exam? Yes, it will be. Um, and I wanted to talk about a couple of aspects about that that really <coughs> struck me. <clears throat> the first one is, not surprisingly, all of these are vector diseases, all of the flaviviruses with the exception of hepatitis C, where you have a vector that feeds on an infected individual, in this case a mosquito, then virus replicates, which is this viremia process, and then, and only after a certain period of time, can this mosquito then transmit this virus to a person. And so the replication that's happening inside the mosquito is very important for allowing transmission to actually take place. And so the probably best control that you could make of these is controlling vectors, um, particularly in the absence of good vaccines for a lot of these. So where are the vectors? Um, as long as you had nice totalitarian regimes, you could get rid of it, but uh, we've lost many of those. And so the vector is really all over the place. And that is partly why and parallels very much where you see the disease. Um, dengue is a huge issue. Um, literally billions of people um, live in these areas um, in the tropics, and there are hundreds of millions of infections a year, many of which uh, are pretty severe. So it's a big problem. We're working on some vaccines, and then in fact that's what Dr. Hirsch is working on to try and deal with vaccines. But there's also been quite a lot of interest in trying to deal with the vector issues and trying to get rid of the mosquitoes. Everyone's heard about Zika, probably more so than they need to hear about, but that's a different story. Um, was spreading in Africa, not obviously very large amounts of disease, particularly the microcephaly aspect, the small heads of newborns. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do very well now with DNA sequencing, which is now cDNA sequencing because these are RNA viruses, is follow the spread of all of these viruses. And so the Zika virus was found, again, originally in Africa, spread to Southeast Asia, got to the South Pacific, and then has now moved to Central and South America and is moving slowly northwards here as well, but fortunately because we don't have many of these 80s mosquitoes here, just like dengue, Zika is not a huge problem in the U.S., although as climate changes, maybe there will be more and more of this going on. <clears throat> How do flaviviruses replicate? They have binding and entry that takes place here. We'll take a little bit more detailed look in that in just a second. Inside the endosomes, there's a pH-induced conformational change. You have membrane fusion that takes place. These are long, positive-strand genomes. They then will get translated as a polyprotein and stuck into the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. This then gets chopped into smaller pieces by both viral and cellular proteases. This is a big difference between the picoRNA viruses and the flaviviruses. There are cellular proteases, which are also involved in this process. They then get assembled in the ER. There's processing that takes place. Again, these are going to be cellular proteases that are involved, and then these are finally released from the surface. Another way of looking at this, basically exactly the same process. Here you have entry of the flavivirus virion and then release after acidification takes place. One of the big problems with dengue has to do with the fact that these host receptors 
can also be mimicked by antibodies. So if you are infected by one of the dengue virus serotypes, of which there are four, you can then have antibodies to that particular one. You may be resistant to that one, but the presence of an antibody that will react with another one of the dengue virus serotypes could lead to extra uptake of virus. So in many cases, a secondary infection with dengue leads to much worse disease as long as it's a different type, which means that making vaccines for these, you have to cover all of them. Otherwise, you could be vaccinated against one and then have one of these viruses circulating, which could then lead to much nastier disease from a bunch of the other ones. So this fusion process, uh, the flaviviruses have a very different kind of fusion. So you may remember we've talked a lot about class one fusion proteins, hemagglutinin, coronavirus spike, uh, all of the paramyxo and um, phyloviruses, also class one kind of fusion proteins, trimers, single transmembrane domain. These are the only ones so far that we talked about which are class two fusion proteins. These ones sitting down in the membrane of the flaviviruses are dimers, and it's only when you have a change in the pH that they become trimeric and then start to stick up away from the viral membrane. So this is a very different kind of fusion protein than all the other ones that we've talked about so far. What does this polyprotein look like? Again, these are membrane-coated viruses, so they have membrane proteins. Most important of those is the envelope protein. That's the one that all the antibodies are to. That's the one which is also the fusion protein. <clears throat> when the polyprotein is made, it transmits across this membrane multiple different times and then is cleaved by both host proteases signalase is a crazy name, it's just a host protease, and then viral proteases. Um, the furin protease is another cellular protease. That's what happens in the very late process as the virus is being produced and it's just about to be released from the cell. The NS5 protein here is the main one. It does just what <clears throat> the products of RNA1 and RNA2 in those cucumber mosaic viruses do. Methyl transferase, which does what? Makes a cap, and RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So, um, and this is the target of some of the best antiviral <clears throat> medications, particularly important for hepatitis C, and these are the ones that cost tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of treatment. Didn't see any of you at the healthcare demonstration yesterday. I was there. Um, <clears throat> so getting larger in terms of the positive strand RNA viruses, the coronaviruses, the largest of these positive strand RNA viruses, um, what do we care about? Um, mostly down here, this guy. But when we talked about the coronaviruses, this is where we really got into the concept of reservoirs and where the virus is circulating in the environment, <clears throat> because certainly in the case of SARS, uh, this is not a generally human virus. Once it gets into humans, you have nasty disease, but in general, that's not where the virus is hanging out or being maintained in the environment. Where that is, is almost definitely bats, Bats have a huge diversity of coronaviruses that are circulating in bat populations, including coronaviruses, which are molecularly extremely similar to the human SARS virus and the ones it's replicating. What do these viruses look like? Crowns, that's the coronavirus. Most important here is that spike protein that's sitting on the outside, but as classic for most of these enveloped viruses, you have this protein in the outside that interacts with receptors and causes fusion. You have a matrix protein, which is interacting with the nucleocapsid protein, which is bound to the genome here present on the inside. 
the spike, which is the class one fusion protein, also interacting with the receptor. Yeah. You talk about crowns. I mean, all all the viruses have some kind of a external capsid protein mm -hmm. for interaction. You're talking about the organization of the genome on the inside as being part of that description circular. Okay, so the question is, sorry, and I'll, I'll paraphrase here. Why coronavirus, and what about the crown? The crown really has to do with the fact that these spike proteins are really long. And so if you're just looking in the electron microscope at the virions, you see these really long projections. And so that's what the crown's about. Um, this interior part, no, that, is, that doesn't have anything to do with it. So it's, it's just the electron microscope of the individual virions where you have these really prominent spike proteins sticking out and much more so for the coronaviruses than any of the other ones. So what's that genome look like? Again, it's a positive strand RNA virus. It's got a cap. It's got a poly A tail. Um, the poly A tail is coded for in the genome. The cap is made by what? Viral proteins, so it's all viral proteins here. These are the only case where you actually have the cell that's making caps is in the case of the, at least for the ones we've talked about, is flu is the orthomyxoviruses, which are stealing caps. Um, otherwise, all of these are viral encoded um, capping proteins. Here, we have a combination of polyprotein and individual proteins that are made. This polyprotein here is made either as just one polyprotein or a slightly longer polyprotein because of frame shifting during translation that happens here giving you a longer protein. It's always going to be the same messenger RNA that's getting translated for this part. Again, in some cases, translation will stop here. In other cases, it will translate here and give you more of your polyprotein. Just like the case with the picoRNA viruses, there are proteases encoded here, which are chopping this into little pieces. Yeah? So is this a pseudo knot that causes that polymerase to lose its uh, recessive? It falls off and stops coding? So what undoes that pseudo knot for it to shift frames and continue? Okay, so it's not actually the transcription machinery, so it's not the messenger RNA that's being made, it's actually the translation here. So it's the ribosome, which then will sometimes stop there and sometimes just keep going through. And so it seems to be interactions between the ribosome and the ribosomal RNAs and the ribosomal proteins that in some cases can pull that pseudo knot apart and continue to translate it and in some cases can't, stops, and falls off. But it's always just that one RNA which is there. So it's a translational regulation, and we'll see that when we talk about other translational changes later on. But then what about these guys down here um, at the three prime end of the genome? So <clears throat> if you look at messenger RNAs that are made in a coronavirus infected cell, you've got these big long RNAs which can be translated to here or translated all the way to here and then a bunch of these shorter RNAs um, all of which are encoding for the structural proteins down here at the three prime end of the genome. So they all have the same sequence at their five prime end, they all have caps on them and they all have poly A tails. How does this happen? It happens because the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, when it's making the negative strand, so you know, this is the RNA that comes inside the cell, as it's making the negative strand, it will hit one of these regulatory sequences and in some cases jump over here to this end. Now, instead of jumping over, this seems really strange, but again, just like all of these other viruses, these are replicating in vesicles, and so everything is all very close together here. So this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase can hop over to here and copy this end, or it can keep going, get to the next decision point, 
keep going or jump to the end, and so on and so forth. And what this means is you end up with lots of these shorter RNAs and many fewer of these longer RNAs. And these shorter, now negative strands, can get replicated into messenger RNAs. These all get translated into protein with the vast majority of the very last protein here, which is the most abundant of the proteins that you're going to find in the rest of the genome. Questions? Yes? So is it the same probability for each of these sites that it will jump or not jump? So it seems to be. The question is, is it the same probability each time the polymerase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase hits one of these things, um, the likelihood that it's going to jump or stay there? It seems to be pretty similar. And, and the reason that that seems to be happening is this sequence here which is exactly the same between each of these different genes. And so it seems to be pretty, now it's hard to tell exactly, but um, pretty similar in terms of the frequency. So you'll end up with uh, you know, as much of this one and then the smaller percentage of this one, smaller percentage of that one, smaller percentage of that one, smaller percentage of that one. OK, so now we switch over and talk about negative strand viruses, uh, paramyxoviruses, <clears throat> phyloviruses, and orthomyxoviruses. Uh, the main thing with our paramyxoviruses, these are the measles and mumps viruses, and they have negative strand genomes. Got a negative strand genome. What does that mean you have to have with you in the virion? Have to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, um, which will then come in with the genome and start to make negative, oh, sorry, anti-genome strands, which are then directly messenger RNAs. We did mention the good old days or when America was great. Um, we had lots of measles cases in the US. In fact, quite a few people were dying of measles. Then we had the vaccine, went down, got really flat, and unfortunately starting to tick back up here. Um, I was looking at my Twitter feed the other day um, people were complaining that anti-vax was, you know, really a kind of a negative thing to say about people. So now I just call them pro-disease. <laughs> so these, the paramyxoviruses, um, have classic type 1 fusion proteins. The, one of the major differences besides the virion shape between the rhabdoviruses and the paramyxoviruses is that the <clears throat> Rhabdoviruses have just one protein that combines receptor binding and fusion. The rest of the paramyxoviruses have two separate proteins that are involved in that particular process. Um, but again, class 1 fusion peptides, trimers that then have a conformational change that releases this fusion peptide, the extremely hydrophobic part there that fuses to the membrane, conformational changes that pull the two membranes together. Both paramyxo and rhabdoviruses have these helical nucleocapsid structures where the N protein, in P in the case of the phyloviruses, is basically on the inside of a helix and the RNA is wrapped around the outside. And you know, why is this so important? Um, something that I think I completely forgot to mention the first time that we went through, which is why I have this you know, review session so I can actually talk about these important things. And that is that the recognition sequence here at the three prime end of the genome, because these are negative strand RNA viruses, for the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, also has sequences which are a long way away in the direct sequence from it but are just as important for binding to the three prime end of the genome. And that's because these sequences, which are bound exactly six nucleotides per nucleocapsid subunit here, give you sequences that in space are right next to each other here. And so when you have the binding by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to the three prime end of the genome, which is really important for this start-stop mechanism that we'll talk about in just a second about making the messenger RNAs. It's sequences which are immediately at the three prime end, but also those that are further away that are really important for the getting that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to bind. So if you think about it, it's this 
big protein that's coming down and binding, but it's not just binding in these sequences at the very end, it's also binding to the other sequences. So it's that nucleocapsid which is serving as the substrate. If you don't have all the proteins bound, you're not going to have the binding by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So what do these genomes look like? Um, in the case of the paramyxos and rhabdos, it's just a single, also for the filoviruses, has this leader sequence here, but again, it's not just the very 3 prime end. There are also sequences which are further away, which are also important for the binding of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That then will start to make the messenger RNA for the nucleocapsid protein, gets again to one of these sequences, not unlike what happens in the case of the coronaviruses, where you can jump to the other end of the genome. Here it's, does the polymerase fall off, or does it start again? If it falls off, it can't restart right here. It's got to go back and bind to that sequence back here at the beginning. And then sequence, I should say, sequence and structure, which is back here at the beginning. And so each time you get to one of these gaps, a certain percentage of the time, it'll fall off. A certain percent of the time, it will stop, make a poly A tail through stuttering, and in some cases restart. This is just all, again, blown up what you see in each of these gray regions here. Start making your messenger RNA, et cetera. So this process, the... <clears throat> excuse me, um, starting and stopping process. Start here, make a messenger RNA. Here, stop, sometimes fall off, start back in here over the, in, or continue without falling off, make the next messenger RNA, so on and so forth. What that means is the messenger RNA for this protein down here, the L protein, which is what? The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which you need the smallest amount of, um, present down here at now the five prime end of the genome, because it's a negative strand um, virus. The way you switch back and forth between making genome and messenger RNA is the presence of the N or NP protein. Again, this is something that we've seen in all of the negative strand RNA viruses that we've talked about. It's that extra N protein, the presence of extra N protein that leads to no longer making messenger RNA and starting to make genomes. Which one is this? Ebola, basically, big, long paramyxo rhabdovirus, more like a rhabdovirus is at this longer shape. Um, only differences are really basically just two of them. Um, one is that start and ends can actually overlap with each other of various different genes as opposed to always being separate which is what you have down here in your paramyxoviruses. The lycoprotein, which actually is really similar to the rhabdoviruses in terms of binding and fusion, this one is made through RNA editing, and the RNA editing, which is the stuttering process that happens in the middle of a messenger RNA. So this is different from the you know, pseudo-knot, which is the translational thing. This really is when you're thinking about the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, that makes a longer protein. In the case of all the filoviruses, no, sorry, not all the filoviruses, just in Ebola virus. It doesn't do this in Marburg, which is bizarre. But in the Ebola virus, makes this glycoprotein. You have to have editing in order to make the glycoprotein. If you don't have editing, the virus is non-functional. Uh, there is some editing that happens in the paramyxoviruses, that editing seems to be not absolutely critical, at least in cell culture, for replicating the actual virus. The other difference molecularly between the filoviruses and the rhabdoviruses is the VP30, which is binding to probably anti-genome here um, rather than the actual messenger RNA and blocking the production of the, literally the NP messenger RNA which is at the very three prime end of the genome. So if you don't make that protein, since it's all start and stop, you're never going to make um, all the rest of it. Anybody hear about the new Ebola viruses, which are actually been reported right here? 
as of, I think, last week. So there are more Ebola virus outbreaks. Again, mostly in Central Africa, probably going to be very well under control. On the other hand, West Africa, they were not well under control. How were those eventually controlled? It was really by use of the appropriate PPE, personal protective equipment, that was not done and took far, far longer than it should have. Um, if that were not the case, it wouldn't be an issue. But nonetheless, everyone got really scared. Is that due to lack of access or lack of funds available for that, or was it just sloppy kind of preparedness? So reasons for why it took such a long time to get all of that to happen. Uh, they're complicated and confused, probably some of everything. Not an appropriate response, took too long, not uh, unavailability. Probably I think the major issue was that there were so many medical professionals who were dying in the process that, that completely decimated the system. So um, don't be scared about Ebola. Be scared about what? Flu. Flu. Good. Good luck on Wednesday.